strange. Okay. Yeah, sorry about the wait there, guys. I just launched the meeting from Zoom directly and it didn't work for me. I mean, it let me in, but nobody was there. And then I followed the link that I posted for you and here we are. That makes me think maybe I copy pasted the wrong link. Let me take a quick look so we can keep things nice and organized. Doesn't have it. All right, we'll figure it out. Okay. Um. So thank you guys for being here today. Uh, today we are going to prepare um, to start talking about the derivatives. So there's a few kind of concepts that we need to discuss a little bit before we can get into the real meat of calculus here. Um, that's what we're going to be doing today. Today is the day I need your honors. Um, I need both your topic for the honors project, and I also need your choice of section for student teaching. I think most people have sent me their section for student teaching, but I think most folks have not sent me their honors project topic. Um, I do have office hours today from 1 to 2 p.m. So if you want to chat about either of those things, come by. Happy to do it. Um, let me grab a little bit of coffee and then we'll get started. Here. Before we get into the actual meat and potatoes today, I wanted to let you guys know I have uh, just now posted the recordings from our last two classes. So I had some issues getting the recordings to convert on my computer because I didn't have enough hard drive space. And every time I would clear out the hard drive space, Santa Fe's cloud software would go like, wait, you didn't mean to delete that 400 gigs of video. Let me download all of it back onto your computer immediately from the cloud. Um, so I had to fight with the, the cloud software a little bit to get it to work. Um, but it did eventually work and they are uploading as we speak. So you guys should have access to those last two class recordings uh, in the next hour or so, however long it takes you to keep the process on. Um, anything else we need to talk about before we get started here? So I, I appreciate the reminder. Yes, the um, student teaching topics and honors project topics uh, are due today. You don't have to have done anything. You just got to let me know what you're going to do. Um, so far, I only have the King's uh, Honors Project topic. So everybody else still needs to send me that. And then I need from both William and Sarah the student teaching uh, section as well. Um, let me show you really quickly what is taken and what is not a little bit. All right. So the sections which have been claimed are 61, 23, 31, 54, 32, 49, and 31. Um, so Natasha and Rana are working together and that's fine. <coughs> uh, so if you guys could please let me know what you would like to do for your student teaching and then I need everybody to let me know what they're doing with their honors project. Uh, remember this, this doesn't have to be a, a, um, a deep or complicated topic choice here. It just has to be something that you're sufficiently interested in to do a, a bit of research. Um, and it has to be a mathematical in nature. If you're having a hard time with any of this stuff, come by the office hours today. We'll talk through it. Okay. And let's take a quick look at our syllabus, make sure we're keeping up with the topics we want to talk about. Um, limits at infinity and rates of change for today. I think we've, we've discussed continuity pretty much ad nauseum. So let's get into the good stuff. Last time I introduced a limit at infinity. Uh, we saw both the kind of intuitive definition and the technical definition. Um, let's get some practice with that stuff today. And if there's time, I'll probably motivate or discuss a little bit the rate of change stuff, but that's mostly for next week. So this is Mac 2311, section OH1, that is Calc Honors. And today is the 3rd of September, 2021. 
on the docket. Um, quick question or quick favor. Um, if possible, um, could you please uh, go back to the original paper that had uh, which uh, person had which section of? Uh, yeah, happy to do that. Introduce. Ah, uh, uh, so yeah, today we're going to talk about limits at plus and minus infinity. We'll get plenty of practice with this. That's section two point six, and then probably we'll have a little bit of time to introduce uh, the concept of a rate of change to section two point seven. I'll tab back over to the spreadsheet here. This is what's this is what's taken. I don't think it's a FERPA violation to show you each other's phone numbers or Santa Fe IDs, but certainly uh, I would. Okay. All right, just let me know when you're done. And we'll get back over the other stuff. I'm done. All righty then. So last time we saw that limits at infinity are the same thing as a horizontal asymptote. Uh, that was kind of the, the intuitive definition. If your curve gets closer and closer to some particular y value as x runs very far off to the left or very far off to the right. And we say that that y value is the limit as x approaches infinity for that function. And you can have more than one of these. In the past, you've seen horizontal asymptotes in the context of a rational function, ratios of polynomials, things like x over x squared plus one. Um, but we're going to be looking a little bit deeper. So rational functions always approach the same horizontal asymptote as x goes to the left or to the right. There are many more complicated functions that approach multiple variables. Maybe one as you go off to the right, another one as you go off to the left. Um, does anybody recognize, just based on the shape, what function I'm thinking of when I draw this little prototype here? Maybe it'll help if I mark a couple y values. Is this sign? This is the inverse tangent function. So the, the basic idea here is that as we wander further and further and further to the right, the y values along this graph get closer and closer and closer to this line, which is this horizontal line here, uh, which is the constant y equals pi over two. And as my graph wanders far off to the left, x going towards negative infinity, the y values on this graph get closer and closer and closer to negative pi over two. Um, so based on this, this behavior here, I'd say that the limit as x goes to positive infinity of the inverse tangent of x is equal to positive pi over 2. And based on this behavior, I'd say that the limit 
as x goes to negative infinity of the inverse tangent function is negative pi over two. Uh, and we did look at the technical definition, right? The technical definition said that if you take some little epsilon window about your suspected limit, you should be able to trap your function inside that window by taking x greater than some fixed constant n, depending on the size of that epsilon window. So this would be pi over two minus epsilon, and up here would be pi over two plus epsilon. And as long as I take x to be larger than n, I take some x value over here, that point on the graph will be trapped inside that window. And the idea is as epsilon gets smaller and smaller and smaller, as I shrink this blue window down, the n value is gonna go up. That's necessarily true, but there will still be some n value such that as long as I take x larger than n, the points on the graph will be trapped within the window. Uh, and you can reverse that over here, right? As long as I take x to be far enough to the left, I can guarantee that the y values will be in this window. Um, and I could shrink that window down and the value of n is gonna get more and more and more negative. In practice, when we go to calculate these things, the n epsilon definition really isn't all that helpful. Um, it can be a source of interesting questions, um, but it's, it's not useful in practice. What is useful in practice is a handful of tricks. So today I'm gonna to show you tricks for finding limits as x goes to plus or minus infinity. And the first trick is, it's really a theorem. Oh, that reminds me of a joke. There's this joke in mathematics. Um, it says, you know, a, a trick, if you use it once, if, if you use something once, it's a trick. If you use something twice, it's a lemma. If you use it three or more times, it's a theorem. So this trick is a theorem because certainly we will use it a lot more than uh, two or three times. I'll just say it. Um, the limit as x goes to infinity of one over x to the p is equal to zero for any positive number p. And the limit as x goes to negative infinity, one over x to the p, that's also zero um, for any positive number p for which the domain of one over x to the p includes negatives. Right. So basically, if you have one over a power of x and that power is positive, in other words, if you have an x piece downstairs, um, then that thing is gonna go to zero as x gets larger and larger and larger as long as this term really belongs downstairs. Uh, and you can say that as x goes to positive infinity for any positive number p, if you've got one over x to that power p, then this piece is definitely going to zero. Um, if you're trying to send x to negative infinity, there's the possibility of a domain issue, right? Like if p is one half, then I can't take this limit, right? One over the square root of x, isn't defined as x goes to negative infinity because you can't plug negatives into that square root. So this is sort of your, your first and most important thing here. Uh, and the proof of this is, is not at all hard. Um, as x gets big, x to the p gets big. And the reciprocal of a big thing is a small thing. So the proof, I'll just sketch really quickly here. Uh, 
as x goes to either plus or minus infinity, we know x to the p goes to positive infinity. All right, if uh, I should say uh, possibly negative infinity. And right, let me put it like this, the absolute value of x to the p goes to infinity. Hence, one over x to the p is going, uh, an absolute value is going to one over infinity, uh, which is zero. So in other words, you can think of one over infinity as zero. One over a very, very large number is a very, very small number. Um, I could give this proof in the n epsilon notation. The choice of n would be the pth root, uh, 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 pth root of one over epsilon. Um, but this is the basic idea. So I don't want to get lost in the sauce. The reciprocal of a big thing is a small thing. I see some questions in the chat about the, the function up here, the inverse tangent function. Yeah, it's an inverse tangent, uh, which is not cotangent, right? Uh, let me backtrack just a second to show you this, and then um, and we'll see where this comes from. I see, I see. OK, nothing wrong with guessing. Um, just in case we didn't talk about it during your interview, I think most of us we did, but um, hide this for a second. Here's the regular tangent function. The inverse tangent function is the inverse of this function, not reciprocal, right? Reciprocal like one over would be cotangent. Um, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about uh, inverse in the same way that the square root of x is the inverse of x squared, or the cube root is the inverse of x cubed, or the natural log of x is the inverse of e to the x. That's what we mean by inverse. The catch is that the tangent function is not one to one, right? This is this fails the horizontal line test really, really hard, unless we restrict to the interval negative pi over two to pi over two. Now that is a one to one function. And we had to do this for all the trig functions in your trigonometry class when you learned how to invert a trig function, um, because they're all periodic, none of them are one to one. So you have to restrict your domain to get a one-to-one -one function, which you can then invert. And if you do that, the inverse is this, all right? And he does have the horizontal asymptotes that I described. The horizontal asymptotes of the inverse function are always the vertical asymptotes of the original function. So this guy has horizontal asymptotes positive pi over two and negative pi over two, precisely because the original function has vertical asymptotes, negative pi over two and positive pi over two. So like this vertical asymptote for the original tangent function becomes this horizontal asymptote for the inverse tangent function. And the same is true for the other one. That's where this is coming from. And, and this is just one of those things that you should know, right? The limit as x goes to infinity of the inverse tangent of x is pi over two. Or as you feed the inverse tangent function larger and larger things, it doesn't have to be an x in here, it just has to be anything that's going to infinity. Um, the inverse tangent of infinity is pi over two. So let me actually add that in here because um, it's a nice way to think of it. One of the things we're always trying to do in calculus is kind of grapple with infinities. And this guy right here, you could say, is that the inverse tangent of negative infinity is negative pi over two. These are statements that I will accept, right? You can, you can tell me this. I will, I will accept this as a true statement. Um, even though infinity is not a real number, there are actually ways to extend the real numbers to include plus and minus infinity. Um, and we, we like to do that when we can. Um, but if you, if you don't like this, there are some people who are really against things like this, and they have good arguments. One of my favorites is a, a professor called 
Doran Zielberger at Rutgers, very, very famous combinatorist who is uh, part of a, a family of mathematicians called the ultra finitists. They really don't like calculus in general. Um, they, they believe that there are a finite number of numbers. Okay, uh, just replace the word infinity with really big number, all right, if that makes you feel better. So the inverse tangent of a really, really big number is something really, really close to pi over two. Uh, we will deal with inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse secant from time to time, but the inverse tangent function and the inverse sine function are the two inverse trig functions we work with most often. All right, let me show you how we use this theorem now. All right. Are we all comfy with what this theorem says? Are there any questions about the theorem? Okay. Another way of stating this theorem, if you're familiar with the term, is to say that the real numbers are Archimedean. It's called an Archimedean field. So an example. At a glance, this does not look like something I could apply that theorem to. But what you'll see is between doing a little bit of algebra and then applying the limit laws that we learned from Yuping, we can break this up into pieces to which our theorem applies. <laughs> All right, let's do it. As you work through this class, you must use good notation. So please always write your limit. Here, I'm just copying down the statement. And in my first line, I'm going to divide top and bottom by x cubed. So if I divide, I'll write it out. All right, I'm going to divide top and bottom by x cubed or multiply the top and bottom each by one over x cubed. I chose x cubed because that's the largest power of x that shows up anywhere in this expression. All right, if x squared was the largest power of x that showed up anywhere, I would divide top and bottom by that. This trick I call the renormalization trick. In physics, renormalization is the term for kind of setting the speed of light to one. You divide all your velocities by the speed of light. So renormalize by dividing top and bottom by the largest power of x. In the expression. This is only useful when you're taking a limit at infinity or at negative infinity. It's not useful for other limits, but if you're taking a limit at plus or minus infinity, this renormalization is a very, very useful thing to do. Because when I distribute up there, you will get a bunch of things that look like a piece from our theorem. So one over x cubed times two x cubed is two minus one over x cubed times x is one over x squared. Downstairs, one over x cubed times x squared is one over x. And then three x cubed times one over x cubed is three.
And then according to our limit laws, you take the limit of the top and the limit of the bottom and split everything up. The limit of a constant is a constant. I'll write it out just this once. So this is then x to infinity of two minus lim x to infinity of one over x squared, all divided by lim x to infinity of one over x plus lim x to infinity of three. All right, in the future, I will not write this step. But we're just using the limit laws, right? The limit laws say you can take the limit of the top and the limit of the bottom separately. And then within each of those, you can take the limit of the difference as the difference of the limits. And the same thing downstairs, you can take the limit of the sum as the sum of the limits. So this is by limit laws. The limit of a constant is just that constant. So the limit as x goes to infinity of two is two. The limit as x goes to infinity of three is three. I'll write this out still, why not? Yeah, the limits are just just of these things now. Right? So this is a, another limit law. Limit of constant is constant. Now this piece and this piece both look like stuff from our theorem. What does my theorem say this limit is? Zero. Good. And similarly, the one over x piece is also zero, right? Here p is two, here p is one. So all together, what do we get? I get two minus zero over zero plus three, which is two thirds. So that's the result. Now I pause for a second, make sure we're comfy with all the steps. Any questions about what we did here? The logical nice and clear. See something in the chat. Feels nice. Good. Very good. Okay. <clears throat> uh, in your pre-calculus classes, you probably learned how to find horizontal asymptotes of something like this, right? They say, oh, well, look at the degree of the top, look at the degree of the bottom. If those degrees match, then you take the ratio of lead coefficients. Well, that's two over three. That's what we got. This is why that's true. This is how you prove that trick from pre-calculus, the ratio of lead coefficients trick. This procedure. applied to a general rational function, r of x equals p of x over q of x, where p and q are polynomials,
uh, is how you prove the horizontal asymptote rules from Brickhoff. Uh, college algebra, really. But we covered again in pre calc. That's probably where you saw it last. Okay. So if you take your arbitrary general rational function and renormalize by dividing through top and bottom by the largest power of x that shows up anywhere, um, you'll prove that if the degree of p is equal to the degree of q, you get out the ratio of lead coefficients. If the degree of Q is larger than the degree of P, you get zero. And if the degree of P is larger than the degree of Q, you don't get anything. So a fun exercise for you guys as honor students would be to do that, okay? If you don't remember the horizontal asymptote rules from your algebra classes, first you need to look those up. Uh, under the review material in the modules, I do have a link to how to graph rational functions and finding horizontal asymptotes is a part of that. So please take the time to remind yourself of those rules and then try to prove it. Just running through exactly the same thing we did here. Generally, when I get to this step, I would say, okay, this goes to zero, this goes to zero. So we get two over three. I wouldn't normally write out all these steps in between. I would just jump from here to here. And I would advise you to do that also. Okay. Any questions on the, the problem or the comment? All right, uh, so you know how to take limits of rational functions now. As x goes to infinity or negative infinity, you can take the limit of any rational function, that's good. Um, but there's lots of functions that aren't rational. Uh, arctan or the inverse tangent function we saw here, that's, that's one of them, but there's many others. Um, and kind of the building blocks of a lot of those are exponential functions. So I'm gonna state this as a theorem also, because I want it to stick in your brain as important. The limit, actually, let's say, if B is a positive number um, larger, let me, let me think about how I want to phrase this. Your textbook just does it for the natural base exponential, but I would like to, um, to go a little bit broader. So let, let me say it like this. If B is bigger than one, then the limit as X goes to negative infinity of B to the X is zero. Yeah, this is fine. Um, some consequences. The limit as x goes to negative infinity of e to the x is equal to zero. The limit as x goes to positive infinity of e to the negative x is zero. Uh, and you know, all the other ways you could, you could parse this. So this fact, that b to the x goes to zero as x goes to infinity, provided b is larger than one. This comes from the graph of the function. Uh, remember, group. I recall that if b is greater than one, then the function f of x equals b to the x is a growing exponential. This graph always looks like
When we talk about growing exponentials, we're usually interested in this side over here where it's getting big. But on the other side over here, it's going towards zero. This is the graph y equals b to the x. It'll always go through zero comma one. It'll always go through one comma b. And as you run off to the left, it'll always go towards zero. So that's it, right? That's, that's your proof. Just look at the graph. <clears throat> these two special cases, these are actually the, the cases that you're gonna bump into most often. Um, that's, as you run off to the left on the graph of e to the x, which looks just like this, because e is bigger than one, you go into zero. And if you run off to the right on e to the negative x, that graph looks like this, but flipped over horizontally, um, then you're also going towards zero. So certainly remember the theorem, but these two special cases are the ones that we will encounter most often. I have one other theorem, and this is related to continuity. If f is a continuous function, then the limit as x goes to could be infinity, but it could also be any finite value. So I'll just say a of f of g of x is the same as f of the limit as x goes to a of g of x. In other words, you can shove limits in and pull limits out of continuous functions. And this theorem down here, this works great if x is going to infinity, but it also works great if x is going to a. When I say f is continuous, I'm saying f is continuous everywhere. But really, f only needs to be continuous at whatever the inner limit is. So you could relax this hypothesis that f be continuous everywhere to just having f be continuous at whatever the value of this limit happens to be. Let's use that to look at an example. Um, something you'll learn about me over the semester. I really love the inverse tangent function. It's my baby. So we got two limits to calculate here. The limit as x goes to infinity of the inverse tangent of e to the negative x and the limit as x goes to infinity of the inverse tangent of e to the positive x. Let's do this guy first. As x goes to infinity, e to the negative x goes where? Zero. Zero. Zero, right? Good. Yeah. In other words, I could write the limb x to infinity inverse tangent of e to the negative x. I can use that theorem above that says this is the same as the inverse tangent of the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the negative x. That's by the theorem above. And then as Yiping told us, e to the negative x, this piece is going to zero. So this is the inverse tangent of zero. What is the inverse tangent of zero? Zero. 
Zero. Very good. That's zero, right? The inverse tangent of anything is the angle between negative pi over two and positive pi over two, such the tangent of that angle is the thing. This is zero. Right? Got to know our inverse trig. And the other guy over here, I'll make this same sort of observation as x goes to infinity, e to the x goes where? Infinity. Very good. e to the x just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So the limit as x goes to infinity of the inverse tangent of e to the x, I can think of that as the inverse tangent of the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the x. And we said this limit, the inner limit here, as x goes to infinity, e to the x goes to infinity. So this would be the inverse tangent of infinity. And what is that? Pi over 2. Very good. This is pi over 2. OK. We could cook up variations on this, right, where I, I take some function whose behavior at both plus and minus infinity is well understood and plug into that some other function whose behavior at plus and minus infinity is understood and then send x to either positive infinity or negative infinity and then use this theorem to sort out those limits. Any questions on this example? All right, there was a problem in your homework that I received a few questions about. I'd like to play around with a variation on that. And then I'm gonna show you one more kind of algebra trick. Let's look at the limit. Uh, actually, let me say it differently. Calculate all horizontal asymptotes. for f of x equals um, e to the x divided by um, 5 e to the x plus 3. Sorry, here we go. Uh, there's a problem similar to this in the homework. And there's more than one way to skin this cat. First, because I'm looking for horizontal asymptotes, what, what should I be doing? Denominator and the uh, um, numerator um, <laughs> divide by e to x. Very good. Yeah, that's going to be one of the tricks I use to calculate the limit. I think you're a step ahead of me here. So before we jump into that, let me just say, because we're looking for horizontal asymptotes, we need to calculate both the limit as x goes to positive infinity of this function and the limit as x goes to negative infinity of this function. Right? Because like the arctan function, like inverse tangent, we could have different horizontal asymptotes on either side. So first, we're going to calculate the limit as x goes to plus infinity of f of x. And to do that, we are going to follow Yiping's suggestion, where you can divide top and bottom by the fastest growing piece. So when I showed you that renormalization trick, I said divide top and bottom by the largest power of x. That's because that's the fastest growing piece um, in a rational function. Uh, but here, this is not a rational function because e to the x is not a polynomial, but I can still use that trick where I divide top and bottom, in this case, by e to the x, or whatever your fastest growing term is. When I do that here, e to the x times one over e to the x, that's one. 
downstairs here, this piece is going to become 5. And 3 times 1 over e to the x is 3 e to the negative x. Right, 1 over e to the x is the same as e to the negative x. And then using our limit laws, we can say, all right, now I'm going to take the limit of the top and bottom separately. And on the bottom, I'll take the limit of the constant 5 and the non-constant function 3 e to the negative x separately. Tell me out. Here's the only piece that's not obvious. What does this piece do and why? Zero. Very good. This piece goes to zero. And it's got nothing to do with the 3. It's got everything to do with the e to the negative x. So this is going to 1 over 5 plus 3 times 0, because e to the negative x goes to 0 as x goes to positive infinity. Now, 3 times 0 is 0, so this is 1 fifth. OK. Any questions on the maneuvers here? Uh, on the problem, there was, uh, it was asked, it would, the, I mean, it was very similar, but it was asking for the, I think it had two horizontal asymptotes and I didn't know how to do it as it, as it approaches negative infinity, like yeah, all so the same process the and everything, but I just, uh, I kept getting the same answer. Okay. Well, let's do that. Right. So we've, we've got, we know that in order to find the horizontal asymptotes, we need to find both the limit as x goes to plus infinity and the limit as x goes to negative infinity. So we've done one of these. Let's do the other. So as x goes to negative infinity, what, uh, what does my function do? Well, that's the limit as x goes to negative infinity of e to the x over 5e to the x plus 3. This one's actually easier. Just using our limit laws, <clears throat> I can say that this is lim x to negative infinity of e to the x divided by lim x to negative infinity. Oh, I'll pop out the 5 e to the x plus three, all right? So here's what we get, just applying the limit laws. Uh, limit of a ratio is ratio of the limits. Limit of a constant multiple is the constant multiple times the limit. And the limit of the constant three is just the constant three. Um, so this really all comes down to figuring out what e to the x does as x goes to negative infinity. And that's something that we talked about a second ago. That was two theorems back. Remember, here's the graph of e to the x. And the horizontal axis here is our x-axis. As we wander off to the left, what does e to the x do? It goes to zero. It goes to zero. So this is zero over five times zero plus three, which is zero thirds. And if I have zero dollars to distribute evenly among my three best friends, each one of them gets zero dollars. <clears throat> so the limit at negative infinity is, is not bad here, um, but we do have to kind of pause for a minute and think about it. And I think it's the case we have not talked about this until today. So uh, don't, don't stress if that didn't I happen. I see what I did. Like uh, I, I noticed it right before we started doing the problem what I did wrong but on the top it said four e to the x. And so what I was doing is I was dividing everything by e to the x. And then I would just be limit of four because e to the x over e to the x would be one, right? Yeah, that's true. And uh, here, because I think the thing to think about dividing everything top and bottom by you know this term is a good trick if that term is getting big. But as x goes to negative infinity, e to the x, he isn't getting big, he's going to zero. So kind of the, 
the thing that should like set off an alarm in your head to use that renormalization trick is are these terms themselves each getting big? If they okay, are, then you want to renormalize, but if they're not, then you don't need to. Okay, thank you. Excuse me, is it every exercise if I uh, want to count uh, horizontal asymptote, I always need to assume x pro approach infinite and I also assume x approach my uh, negative infinite. That's correct. Yep. If we're looking for the horizontal asymptotes, we always need to calculate both of those limits. The limit at positive infinity and the limit at negative infinity. The only exception is if you're dealing with a rational function. If the function you're playing with is just a polynomial over a polynomial, then those limits will be the same at plus and minus infinity, and you, you can skip the negative infinity one. But in general, if you're asking like, what's the procedure I can always follow to find horizontal asymptotes, we do need to calculate both of those limits. All right, I said there's one other kind of flavor of algebra trick that I wanna show you here. Um, so let's, let's do that. These are not as easy to cook up off the top of your head. So I'm gonna grab this out of your textbook. We are here. So, Stuff like that, stuff like that. Um, oh yeah, and we should do some squeeze down practice also. Okay. There's a fun one. Yeah, something like these. Let's do this. Number 27 looks good. Now we've got the square root of 9x squared plus x minus 3x, and we want to send x to positive infinity. So let me write that down. And this will give us an opportunity to talk about the remaining tricks. What is that? Square root of 9 squared plus x. Minus 3x. All right. Let's throw some parentheses in there. So kind of the challenge here is that as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this stuff gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So this piece on its own would be going to infinity. And the square root of infinity is still infinity. Uh, this piece also gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So you get something like infinity minus infinity. And it turns out that infinity minus infinity is a problem. We're gonna talk about these more later when we get to the section on L'Hopital's rule, but infinity minus infinity, zero over zero, infinity over infinity, zero times infinity, one raised to the infinity, and uh, what else am I forgetting? Zero to the zero are all undefined. Uh, the technical term here is that they are indeterminate. Indeterminate forms. What's meant by the term indeterminate form is just based on the symbols here, infinity minus infinity or zero times infinity or zero to the zero, you can't say what the limit is. I can say for sure that one over infinity is zero. Comfortable and confident, no issues there. Um, but I cannot say for sure that zero over zero is one. Like you can't cancel those, you can't cancel these. Um, I can't say that infinity minus infinity is zero. None of that is true. So these are all expressions that you will encounter as you kind of naively take limits, um, but none of them are carry enough information to say for sure what the limit is. I will show you plenty of examples where zero over zero is equal to one. Plenty of examples where zero over zero is equal to pi. 
plenty of examples where zero over zero is equal to negative three or positive infinity. All of it can happen. So those are just collections of symbols you can write down that don't carry enough information. There are always things that you get out as limits um, and it's, it's just a, a red flag. It tells you, you know, you need to stop and go back and be careful. If I naively send x to infinity in this expression, I get infinity minus infinity. So that's not going to do the job. What will work here is um, that multiply by the conjugate trick. So here's how I'd actually get started on this. The equation multiple number number uh, numerator divided by denominator the same um, square root nine x square plus x plus three x. Perfect. Yep. So I will multiply and divide by the thing you get swapping this minus to a plus. That's the expression I would refer to as the conjugate of the original expression. In the same sense that, uh, you know, two minus three i is the complex conjugate of two plus three i. And you might ask, well, can't I cancel this and this term? Yeah, I could, but that just takes me back to where I started. The whole reason I'm doing this is to distribute out the top and see what we get. Something nice might happen. Indeed, something nice does happen. This square root times this square root just gives me the inside. So again, writing my limit using good notation, I'll have here 9x squared plus x. That's from multiplying these two together. When you multiply the outer, you get plus 3x times the square root. When you multiply the inners, you get minus 3x times the square root. So those cancel, they go away. And then you just have minus 9x squared. And downstairs, you have your 9x squared plus x under the radical plus 3x. And of course, this 9x squared and this minus 9x squared, they gobble each other up. So I'm left with just x over the square root of 9x squared plus x plus 3x. OK. So at this stage, if I try to naively plug in infinity for x, this piece is going to infinity. This piece and this piece are also going to infinity. So now instead of infinity minus infinity, I have something like infinity over infinity. Which might be like and the better. I'm sorry, go ahead, Yipin. Numerator and the denominator divide by square root x square. Very good, yeah. So this is, we're in one of those situations now where I can renormalize. Um, the fastest growing term upstairs here is x. We also have an x downstairs. And then from this piece, I have an x squared, but it's under a square root. So all of these terms grow at about the same speed. Let me, let me make a note of this. All the terms here, x, 3x, and the square root of 9x squared plus x grow at approximately the same speed. Um, if we were using Landau notation, I would say that they are all big O of x. Or if you want to use the tilde notation, you could say they're all tilde x. 
Um, if you're not familiar with Landau, big O notation or the tilde notation, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. These all grow at about the same speed, um, which is linear. Linear speed. They grow at about the speed of x itself. The term that's kind of weird is the square root of 9x squared plus x. Um, but you know x squared grows faster than x, so this is kind of the dominant term. And an x squared under a square root, if it's not equal to x um, because there's, you know, algebra of square roots is not quite that nice, um, but it's similar in its asymptotics. So as Yiping suggested, I'm going to renormalize. I'm going to divide top and bottom, uh, in this case, by x. And then in one of those cases, I'm going to rewrite x as one over, or as the square root of x squared. So I'm dividing top and bottom by x. And what that's going to get me is a numerator of 1. And then downstairs, when I distribute, I'll write it like this. I've got the square root of 9x squared plus x times 1 over x plus 3x times 1 over x is just 3. Now at this stage, I want to put these pieces together. In other words, I want to get this guy under the square root. The way to do that is to rewrite it as the square root of 1 over x squared. Since x is going to infinity here, we can assume that x is positive. Which, among other things, implies that x is the same thing as the square root of x squared. So the 1 over x, I can write as the square root of 1 over x squared like this. If x was going to negative infinity, then this wouldn't be true. Um, so let me, let me deepen the note here with a little recall. In general, the square root of x squared is the absolute value of x. So if I was taking the limit as x goes to negative infinity, I would have to be a little bit more careful. I would want a negative here, or you could say a negative here. We'd end up having to be careful with a minus sign if I was sending x to negative infinity. All right, cordon these off so I don't clutter things too badly. So now this guy, I'm thinking of him as the square root of 1 over x squared, which means I can now combine those under a single square root. And I get lim x to infinity 1 over the square root of, I'll write it out, 9x squared plus x times 1 over x squared. And I still have my plus 3 over here. So you've got a square root of some things times the square root of another thing. You can write that as the 1 square root with those two things multiplied inside. Now in here, I distribute my 1 over x squared. Nine x squared times one over x squared is nine, and x times one over x squared is one over x. And I also still have my plus three here. 
And it's at this stage where I can use my theorem now. So what does this guy do as x goes to infinity? Zero. It goes to zero. So this limit is one over the square root of nine plus zero plus three, which is one over three plus three, which is one sixth. And that's how we handle these guys. Sometimes you'll be given a problem that looks like this originally, you know, like x over the square root of some stuff plus 3x, something like that. Sometimes you'll be given as it is here at the very start, where you have to work it into that shape. But this trick of renormalizing, dividing top and bottom by the fastest growing term, is a useful trick in many settings. And again, the way to tell if you should use the renormalization trick is by asking yourself, are the individual terms here getting big? Is there a term that's going to infinity, which is giving me a headache? If the answer to that question is yes, divide out by that term. And that will allow you to more readily compare the, the speeds, the top and the bottom. Um, this question is perhaps a little bit more involved than a typical exam question. It's, it's, it's very close. So uh, this exact question could show up on a test. Um, the question was, how much harder will the test problems be? Um, Calculation-wise, the test problems will not be any harder than this. Certainly, this if I were to put this on a test as a calculation problem, I would consider that a difficult problem um, because you have you know, only so much time. But the questions on the test that tend to catch people out are not usually the calculation questions. As long as you do the homework, you'll be good at the calculation. It's the concept questions. Um, so I, I would say that the calculation questions on the test will not be any harder than this and will mostly be easier than this. Um, but the challenging questions on the test for most people usually are the concept questions, like where I, I give you a graph and I ask you for some statements about limits of that function, or um, I give you some statements about limits and I ask you to sketch for me a graph that will, that will have those properties. So the stuff to pay careful attention to, I'll show you here. There are some problems in WebAssign that I've given you this week um, that I feel are similar to the types of questions I ask on tests. Um, so let me, let me identify those for you. And then I'll let you go. All right. So there are a few here where I say, like, you know, suppose f of x has all of these different limits. Lim as x goes to two is five. Lim as x approaches three from the left is four, all that shit. And then we say sketch a graph that has these features um, like this. These are the sort of problems that I've noticed people having a hard time with on my tests. And I think one of the reasons is that when you practice this in WebAssign, it's, you're not sketching a graph, you're picking a graph that matches those criteria. So as you solve these problems, and I'll say this always, anytime WebAssign says, draw a graph that blah, 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 or sketch the graph of this function, sketch the graph on your own. Don't pick it from these, sketch your own graph, and then match to one of these. Um, going through that, that process of synthesis, where you come up with something is a really important, not just creative step, but also comprehension step. Um, so those are the things that I, I think folks would have a little bit of a hard time with on the test. One more thing. My true-false questions are infamous on campus here. People, people complain about my true-false a lot. Many of those true-false questions come straight out the book. Um, not all of them, of course. I think of them myself, but there's only so many questions that you can ask uh, that are interesting. And oftentimes the things I find interesting overlap with the things the textbook author finds interesting. Um, so another way you can prepare yourself for the concept questions on the test is to look at the true false questions in the book. Um, generally looking at the chapter reviews is, is wise. Um, all right, I think that's everything I wanted to share with you guys today. Where are we? We have three minutes left. Let's do a squeeze theorem problem because we have not had a lot of practice with that. Before the exam, will you help us review those chapters for uh, prepare for the exam? 
Uh, so I will publish something that I call a study guide that has a few kind of fun problems that are about the level of difficulty as the test problems. Um, but we will not have like a dedicated review day, at least not most of most of the time. Most of the time we um, you will be on your own to prepare. But I will, like I just did here, say these are the problems you should work. These are the things you should look out for. And then if you want to work those problems with me, uh, we can do that in, in office hours. When is our first test going to be? Um, I think right around the 24th. Thank you. Yeah, during this week, between the 20th and the 24th. All right. Um, a question that I like to ask in pre-calculus and college algebra is, is it possible for the graph of a rational function to cross its vertical asymptotes? And is it possible for the graph of a rational function to cross over one of its horizontal asymptotes? The answer to those are no and yes, respectively. A rational function cannot cross a vertical asymptote, but a rational function can cross a horizontal asymptote. If you're talking about a bigger family of functions, not necessarily rational functions, the answer to both of those questions is yes. Here's an interesting example of a function. It's not a rational function, but which does cross over its horizontal asymptotes, not once, not twice, infinitely many times. Okay. Boom. This function, sine of x over x, is actually quite famous. Um, it's got a name, it's called the sinc function. And it's very important in um, number theory, signal processing, Fourier analysis, and full of other places. Uh, I've used it uh, myself in number theory research quite a bit. Its graph is pretty cool. You kind of start with your regular sine graph. But observe that this is 1 over x times the sine of x. So it's almost like the regular sine function, but with an amplitude of 1 over x, which is, of course, decaying. So I'll mark this as 1. This guy is undefined at 0. And then he does the normal sine thing. But that amplitude is always decaying. So these little hills get smaller and smaller. It turns out this is an even function. You divide an odd function by another odd function. You get an even function. And it looks like that. It's got that y-axis symmetry. A boundary for this guy. Can be identified and also a lower bound can be identified. Anybody care to posit a guess on the blue curve? Who do I think he might be? based on this. Maybe we should go through and discover it. All right. So I mentioned this is a squeeze theorem limit. Yeah, it's challenging because the sine x piece just oscillates forever and ever and ever. It doesn't actually do anything nice. Um, but the x piece downstairs, this 1 over x piece, he wants to go to 0. So this is like 0 times something whose limit does not exist. That's a little weird. 
maybe one other little note. The limit as x goes to infinity of sine x itself, this does not exist. Same is true of cosine. Because x on the denominator, so it's um, it's not exist. Well, so the x in the denominator here is actually going to help things. Without this, the limit does not exist. So just sine x on its own, as x goes to infinity, this limit does not exist. But it turns out this limit right here does exist. So having the x downstairs here helps. It makes things better. Without that, then we're in trouble. So let me show you here. Recall that the sine function is always bounded between negative one and one. If I then divide through each term by x, I get this, which is true for all x. greater than zero, and I'm hoping to take the limit as x goes to positive infinity, so that's fine. Now, if I take limits everywhere, the limit as x goes to infinity of negative one over x is less than or equal to the limit. Zero from the left side. Very good x over x is less than or equal to the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x. Yeah, in fact, all, all of these are easy, right? The outer functions here are easy. This is 0. So you get 0 is less than or equal to the limit as x goes to infinity of sine x over x is less than or equal to this one is also 0. So by the squeeze theorem, the inner limit there, limit as x goes to infinity of sine x over x, this is going to be zero. It's equal to zero. Yep. And that's it. So a few things to take away from this. If you have an oscillating function that's bounded, multiplied by something that goes to zero, that's gonna go to zero, it'll get squeezed. The way you show it is the squeeze theorem. The other thing I'd like you to remember from this example is that these two limits on their own do not exist. That's important. I, un unfortunately, I see people calling this zero, I see people calling this one. Um, it's not any of those things, this does not exist. And the same is true for cosine. Also secant and tangent, but people rarely make that mistake. Okay, I do see those few things in chat here. Make sure we address this, Rod has got to go. Yeah, David's guess on the boundary curve was correct. Um, let me close up just by showing you a nicer graph of the sync function. Here it is, we can rescale a little bit. So here's what the sine x over x function looks like. Yeah, and it does oscillate, those oscillations decay. So sine x over x can pass by the vertical asymptote. Uh, the horizontal asymptote, yeah. So the horizontal asymptote here is the line y equals zero. It's kind of a weird thing, 
but it does. It crosses over its horizontal asymptote, not just once or twice, but infinitely many times, which is pretty cool. And then I'd also like to show you the boundary curves here. Here's one over X. And I can just pay attention to X is greater than zero. And here's the other one, negative one over X. And again, X greater than zero, stay focused there. So on the right-hand side here, you're bounded above by the blue function. You're bounded below by the green function. And because those both go to zero, as we come way out here, no matter how hard the red function tries to avoid it, it's getting trapped. It's getting squeezed, squeezed, squeezed. Can't help it. Red function. So that's a, one nice application of the squeeze law. Uh, of course, there are many others. Um, and you're likely to see at least one of them on your test. So uh, work through the homework. If you get stuck on anything, you can come see me in office hours. Please send me your topics for your student teaching and for your honors project. Um, I would like those no later than Monday. If you need a little bit more time to sort it out, I understand if you wanna come talk to me in office hours, uh, I can help you with your decision-making process there on either of those things. If you need help with homework, try the Discord, send me a Canvas message, um, or of course, come by office hours. Uh, the tutors can also be helpful. I think that's everything we want to say today. Any questions for me before I let you go? Um, I still have uh, questions uh, because as I know that if X in the denominator always uh, is a, have a vertical asymptote at that. So I think sine X over X, maybe there has a vertical asymptote too. Yeah, that's a reasonable thing to think, right? But here is the graph of sine x over x. It, it, because of the x in the denominator, we expect it to have a vertical asymptote, but it doesn't. So it is actually undefined at x equals 0. Um, but what you're asking there is actually a really deep question that I would love to get everybody thinking about. So why doesn't f of x equals sine x over x have a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. In other words, or i.e. what is the limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x. Turns out this limit is one, but it's a little bit hard to show. And if you want to start looking at that, I can give you a hint. The proof I'm going to show you for that limit is geometric in nature. Here's the unit circle. I know if I rotate up by some, so let me think of this in terms of the variable theta. This is the point one comma zero you know that this point right here is the cosine of theta comma the sine of theta, right? That's because we're on the unit circle. So this vertical distance here is sine theta. And this horizontal distance here is cosine theta. If you compare a few other triangles, like this blue triangle, the sector of the circle here and his area and then there's multiple ways to do this you can look at the little right triangle in there but the easier one is to look at the triangle defined by the tangent here
All right, what you'll find is that, of course, based on inclusion, the little triangle is smaller than the area of the sector, which is smaller than the big blue triangle. So these areas satisfy this inequality. You can then use the squeeze theorem. So find each area. Then use the squeeze theorem. To calculate the limit as theta goes to zero of sine theta over theta. Um, this is sort of the nicest, nicest way I know to, to find this limit, to show that you don't have a vertical asymptote. Basically, the sine function near zero behaves very similar to x near zero. Uh, so we'll, we'll be able to find that this limit is, is not infinity or negative infinity. It's, it's actually one. Um, but the proof requires some geometry or use of power series. And certainly we're not ready for power series. So the proof I'll give you is geometric. It's going to go like this. And if you want to work it out on your own or at least get started with it on your own, I think that would be a great exercise, but you're not required to. All right, that's where we're going to leave it for today. I will see you guys on Wednesday of next week. Between now and then, I may post some stuff to Canvas for you to look at because losing a day this early in the semester sucks. Um, make sure you finish the homework. If you have any questions for me, come see me in office hours. Otherwise, I'll see you next week. Take care, guys.